Good. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning to everyone and welcome. Welcome to our panelists and welcome to our listening audience um, who I know is seeing us and hopefully seeing us and hearing us <coughs> very, very clearly. <laughs> uh, firstly, I will start by asking our uh, panelists to unmute. Feel free to unmute. Uh, we have tech support to the back who will be managing um, you know, those aspects. So we don't have that awkward moment where we are speaking and we have forgotten to put on our mics, okay? Um, let me say thank you for taking uh, time to be part of our discussion, dialogue, conversation this morning. Uh, we, today we are treating with the issue of working in the virtual environment. And fundamentally, we are looking at a practical approach um, to managing teams. Um, this is one of the many webinars that the Inter-American Development Bank has been hosting as a result of their continued commitment and efforts to demonstrate their support to their member countries, partners, and you know, of course the wider, the wider uh, community, especially in this situation or in this case of COVID-19. And I think we all know that COVID-19 has affected all aspects um, of our lives, yeah? Um, my name is Joseph Kahn, and I am with the Inter-American Development Bank. I'm a project management consultant, and I will be the host um, for today's session. Um, I just want us to also recognize that, you know, the COVID-19 situation would have placed not just us as individuals, but organizations and we have been actually pushed or shoved uh, into um, adjusting to the challenges of how we continue to be a productive workforce, um, how we continue to function and deliver, you know, on our organization object. Context, we have invited nationals um, represented, uh, you know, the, a cross-section of, of the various um, industries and, and, and organizations. And they are here with us to share and interact directly, you know, with the listening audience, um, and also to give their position and perspective, you know, on this whole new philosophy of, of you know, working in the virtual environment. Um, so I would like to quickly introduce um, our guests this morning. Um, we firstly would like to recognize Mrs. Um, Karina Coburn. Um, Karina is the Chief of Operations at the IDB Trinidad and Tobago Country Office. Um, Karina is uh, also a colleague um, at the IDB. We have Mr. Hanif Benjamin. Uh, Mr. Benjamin is the Chairman of the Children's Authority. Um, he is also a clinical um, psychologist, yeah, he's a traumatologist as well, yeah, um, and Mr. Ben, no, I probably got it wrong, okay, we'll fix that. <laughs> we also Our have Mr. Therapist. Omar Mohamed, um, <laughs> clinical therapist, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, we also have Mr. Omar Mohamed, Omar is the CEO of the Cropper Foundation, significant work with UNESCO and NGOs and so on. Um, and we also have uh, Mirko Bialso, owner and operator and entrepreneur of the Mamma Mia and the Amor Mio um, restaurant. Um, Mirko is also an Italian. Yes, Mirko, you're an Italian. Living in Correct. Trinidad and Tobago si. at this point. Yeah. Italiano. And we, yes. And we also, yeah. we also have Ms. Rocio Medina Bolivar, and Rocio is the country representative for the IDB Trinidad and Tobago Country Office. 
All right, so welcome to our panelists and again, welcome to the listening audience. Uh, just a couple of house rules before we move forward. Um, and this is really to the listening audience. Um, we are in the Zoom uh, interface, the Zoom facility. Um, and I know you'd want to pose uh, your questions uh, to the panelists and you can please do so in the question and answer uh, function of the Zoom, not in the chat section. All right, I'll repeat that again. For questions that you would like the panelists to address, please utilize the question and answer function of the Zoom. Okay, so you could feel free to leave the chat section for any general comments and so on. Okay, um, so it's really a conversation that we are having um, this morning. We have a tight one hour, but before we move forward with our panelists, we would really like to um, invite the country representative, um, Ms. Rocio, to make some brief comments before we move on. Thank you, Joseph, Proceed. and good morning, and welcome all the audience. Good morning, do you hear me? Do you yes, hear me? Yes, we're hearing you, yes. Well, See. yes, great. Good morning again, and welcome everyone, all the audience uh, attending to the, to the webinar. In times of COVID-19, I think we keep hearing every day, what is the new normal? And I'm just wondering how this look like? And, and when you look around, I think this is, not a, I mean, this is not a simple answer because it really differs on the circumstances that each of, each of us has. But I think what is in common is that everyone is being forced to adapt. And those who adapt the best, which includes persons, NGOs, businesses, public sector agencies, are the ones who has embraced the absolute need to be agile, to be creative, to transform their businesses and use technology as much as possible. And all of this also can differ and it can be different for all of us. That's why I'm very glad this morning to see a very diverse panel that, that shares and represents different experiences from the local business, the public sector, the civil society, and the IDB. For some, this experience may be seamless, and for others, definitely could be challenges. But I think we can say that nobody's alone on this venture. And I hope this webinar represents a chance for all of us to share our experience on how this process has been, and actually, as Joseph said, to have a frank conversation on how is this function in the, this new virtual environment and in the area of social distance? For those who has missed it, I mean, uh, it was a very interesting live conversation uh, last Monday with President Moreno from the IDB Group and the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, Professor Schwabs. Professor Schwabs is very well known for calling attention to what is referred to the fourth industrial revolution, which basically see the wars undergoing shifting and changes and disrupting because of new technologies. But ready or not, what we see in the world right now is this transforming and is really changing in different ways. And as Professor Schwab says in that discussions, we, the world cannot return to what of the old systems or of our old habits that we are accustomed. So we need to adapt. In the 90s, we saw the increasing connectivity with the World Wide Web and the dot-com boom. In the 2000s and 2010, also we see the growth of mobile, mobile technology, the apps, more connectivity to the global internet. And this decade for, ahead of us, I think it will be more rapid and evolution because of we having uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, innovations, and new technologies. So while I don't expect this, this um, you finish the webinar, uh, like learning about machine learning and how you manage your teams, I hope that you have a takeaway ideas on how we can do better. Going forward, the IDB team is remained very, very dedicated to work closely with our partners in the public sector, in the civil society, in the private businesses, you know, and the wide populations in order to chart in Trinidad and Tobago in the course of the future. So with that, I really thank you again for joining us this morning, and I hope everyone has a very fruitful and productive discussion. <laughs> Back to you, Joseph. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you for that. Um, those, those introductory comments. 
uh, colleagues, we want to really kickstart this conversation, um, recognizing that you know working in virtual en environment um, requires significant systemic and policy uh, changes. And, and these changes, you know, is really to accommodate employees um, to ensure that, you know, not only that they continue to, to, to function and, and deliver and, and, and so on, uh, but very importantly, the whole question of, of disconnection, you know, and, and I think we appreciate the, the, the social architect of organizations and, and the need for connection, but, but more so, um, that question of policy, that question of, of systems, that, 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 that question of, of strategy um, is necessary. And I, and I think to um, start this conversation, um, I want to engage Karina, um, you know, to share her position, her perspective, her experience on this, you know, coming from the Inter-American Development Bank, um, you know, uh, type of structure. Uh, Karina, can you share with us some of these policy and systemic transformation that you would have engaged? Good morning, Joseph. Morning to my fellow panelists and to participants. It's it's a pleasure to, to be able to converse on this issue, especially at this time when it's particularly relevant. Um, Joseph, you, you raise a good point in terms of um, the need for policy changes in large organizations like the IDB. Um, the structure often doesn't accommodate rapid change, um, the agility that Rocio mentioned. And so I would say in terms of our policy developments in relation to working virtually, this has been a project over many, many years. I would say it's at least five years since the bank introduced a telework policy. Um, this applies to our, our country offices, 26 of those, and then we have three additional offices across the world. And um, the policy applies to all. And I would say even up until the, the time of the pandemic, where now the entire bank is working um, on mandatory um, telework. Um, until that time, we still perhaps had not fully adopted uh, um, the teleworking policy, and it was very much uh, a work in progress. So the mandate that senior management gave to us was to work at least one day per week from home in every office, in every business unit, and for the most part, I would say 90% of the institution was doing that, but there would still be pockets within the institution where this was a challenge. And yeah. so, yeah. Um, like it or not, now we have mandatory telework and it has become part of our reality. Um, but this has taken many, many years of preparation and testing and experimentation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As you, as you say that, clearly your organization is, has a level of uh, maturity, you know, to, to adjust. Um, springboarding from that, you know, if we bring it into another sort of public sector environment, more so state enterprise, I, I wonder how would um, Hanif respond to this, you know, seeing that um, your organization, you seem to be an essential type of, 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 of organization and possibly you may not have been prepared, um, you know, but how would you have uh, adjusted to this um, transformation? Thank you so much, um, Joseph, for that question. And I think, um, thank you for having me springboarding from um, the, the, the previous commentator, um, I, I, I admire the fact that they had so many years of practice, but for us, we are just celebrating or commemorating five years anniversary as an organization. So we are still going through growing pains, more so the advent of this curveball. If there was ever to be a curveball, this would be it um, in terms of operation. More so where our operation is very 
um, humanistic in that we interact with humans on a daily basis. That's the that's a core business taking care of children, and so we cannot take care of children primarily from home. Yeah, we must go to visit homes. We have to do assessment, and so when this thing came as a board, we knew we had to think quickly as to how to ensure continuity in terms of what we do on a daily basis. Because we have under our purview, our emergency response team that is 24 hours, um, our child support center, reception center, that is 24 hours with children in it. We also have our investigation unit. We also have our registry unit, which is also 24 hours. So these people cannot work from home. And so as a board, what we did very early is um, institute a committee, and that committee is led by our deputy chair, Dr. Wheeler, um, and we call it the Children's Authority Emergency Response Unit. And we had to consider a number of things quickly. One, our HR policies, because we recently confirmed our HR policy. Now we had to go back in it to re-engineer to suit this accommodation. We had to look at our IT policies, because all our policies were really meant for people in the office. So we had to change our IT policies as well as our IT structure, our, because now we have to get more bandwidth, we have to get different programs, people are now working from home. Albeit as a board, about a year ago, we began transforming into this um, paperless technological way. And so we instituted Convene, which is a, a board portal, so I thank God that we were able to at least do that so we could continue our, our work. And, and, and we also had to look at the risk analysis for the organization because of the 24 hour nature. So those were some of the early things that we did. And I must say, having done that, it gave us a great advantage for business continuity. Even though we are a young organization still in transforming process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hanif. Um, and how you would have treated with the cultural um, changes? Because, you know, when you're in a particular environment, we are comfortable, you know? Um, yes. And here's, here's now we are thrust into this virtual space, as we say, um, the use of technology. You know, sometimes we are accustomed to come in and actually sign in on documents. Now, we have to electronically sign and so on. You know, how, how did you make that shift, um, you know, to, within that sort of still, social dimension? We are still making that shift and I'll tell you this, because a big part of the company must work, meaning get up, come out of their house and engage. But we also have a big part of the agency that is working from home. So for us, the biggest question is, how do you balance that, that those who are at home and those who must come out in the risk area? How do you manage that? That in itself is a cultural nuance that we must get over. Also, a lot of our work require, as you said, report and signatures because we are creatures of the court, meaning we must go to a court to solidify a treatment plan. I must physically sign those treatment plans. So the driver has to find me wherever I am to bring hundreds of treatment plans for me to physically sign. We have not gotten to a place with the court to put an electronic signature on such a document. When we are filing, thank God the court moved electronic filing, so that saved us a bit. But a lot of what we do require that physical presence. And we are still trying to maneuver who are the people required to be in the office, who are the persons who require to be found to sign, and all of these things. So on one end, we are battling with the humanistic cultural nuances, and on the other end, we are battling with the technological cultural nuances. And so as a board and management, we have to find that balance between who signs, who may not sign. As a matter of fact, what we did, we increased the number of signatories just in case the director should fall ill. Who will ensure that pay continues? Who will ensure that our creditors are paid? You know, if I should get sick, who would sign as a chairman of the board? All of those things were cultural things that we had to grapple with as a board and quickly in order to, to come out on top of this. 
Yes, yes. Okay, thank you for that. I want to I want to bring in along those the lines of the the human side. Um, I want to bring in Omar and Mirko a bit, and more so focusing on um, how would have you uh, make that shift. Yes, but more so. Um, how did you treat with the onboarding and the orientation of, of, your, of your human resources? Mirko, you uh, being an entrepreneur, small business, you're into the food industry, you know, chefs, caterer, caterers, front staff. Omar, you, you know, working along with NGOs, also doing field work and those kind of things. How, would, how did you go about making that, um, that, that, that shift? Um, reorienting uh, re and, and, and onboarding and so on. Mariko, you can probably um, go first. Okay, buongiorno. Thank you, everyone. And, uh, well, of course, nobody, I think, is ready to those events. These are uh, those events which uh, don't be expected, like uh, the war or anything else. So for that is the most things is to be proactive, reactive. Trinidad and Tobago, they are the advantage point to be about two, three weeks beyond what happened in Europe. So for that, we got a little hint or a little taste of what maybe going to be here in Trinidad and Tobago. Of mm -hmm. course, hopefully for the, for the best, not for the worst. And uh, so for that, to be proactive, to see on uh, what's going on with other country, uh, with their own uh, um, solution or what uh, is uh, their own... Uh, way to do. So basically it was to be proactive and uh, after proactive, you get all your information as much as you can to try to make the best, uh, of course, decision uh, for what you got. But it's a, a hour by hour process. It's not like something you know, on a regular basis you can do, oh, I can do a project from now for the next year, you know, with the kind of event like what happened in Codiv uh, is something you have to do day by day or hour by hour because uh, mm -hmm. it can be changed drastically in a in a chief, in not in short time. So yeah. doing that is uh, be proactive uh, to get all information as you can, the good information, of course, and then uh, to be a connector with your staff. So mm -hmm. the things is you have to get your main staff and to bring them on board, to mm -hmm. show them, uh, to tell them exactly what's going on because not everybody can be uh, aware of certain dynamics. Nobody right. have access or certain information or whatsoever. So for that is uh, to really work straight with your um let's call inner circle of your staff and then them to go towards to the others so to see uh how okay uh, that is the situation how we can uh, move forward or what we stay close forever or whatsoever because we don't know now up to now we know phase one two three four five but we don't know each phase if it's finished or is it finished early or is it being extended or any other stuff so for that is uh I see when you really make a trust on those uh, on your staff uh, or your employee and uh, you get things in return. So for that is uh, to get to find any idea. So for that we came up with the idea with the Prontimia, which is uh, like a, a restaurant quality food uh, on a supermarket, which the only place will be open for a certain time or all the gourmet shops. And then also, of course, uh, safety first, because unfortunately, as much we're gonna use technology, which we use it because now even the way to sell, I know you have to go to on um, all um, social media, you have to have a different way to uh, ship the, your food to um, customers. And now, you know, you can use technology, but uh, maybe in the next 50 years, we're gonna have a uh, food in a pills. <laughs> but uh, for now, we unfortunately, physically, we have to cook. So yes, that yes, is yeah. uh, nothing we can uh, adjust yeah. technology. Technology, but it helps uh, how to distribute what we're making or also to make uh, because of the situation, you know, it's not easy for people around because uh, salary are being shortened or, you know, people lose the job. I mean, also we have to, as a restaurateur, we have to see really all what's going around for each level. Mm -hmm. So, okay. and okay. the demands of what the people saw for that is uh, without cutting corners. Because I know there is a way to cut in corner, but there's not our line. So yeah, we have yeah. to adjust yeah. in all our various experts, aspects. Sorry. Okay. And so okay. for that is not okay. easy. Thank you. But with our yeah. team, you're welcome. So. Yeah. Thank you. No, right. I'm just wanting Omar to jump in here because uh, Omar works along with NGOs. You have your internal staff and so on. 
And here we are talking about the transformation, the human side, the, the, the change. But what I've heard from, from everyone thus far on this topic is that change is a process. It's not an event. It don't happen today for tomorrow. Um, and clearly, you know, that is, that is uh, an approach that you have taken, uh, Morocco. Um, but Omar, how, how um, has this been for you? Um, well, morning, everyone. I think it's been fairly similar. We, as Mirko said, we will well, we were fortunate enough to have that um, couple of weeks lag behind what was going on in Asia, then Europe, and what we sort of expected to happen here. So we actually started having these conversations with staff and with our, all our because we we have small staff, but we have a very wide network of you know people that work with us, consultants, other NGOs, that sort of thing. So we actually started having these conversations, I would say at least three weeks before the official um, stay at home order was put in place. So we started putting work into what a work from home policy would look like for us. We shared it around, we, we, we had almost daily conversations about what that would look like for people in their mm -hmm. different situations. We tried to have as much conversations as possible with the external consultants that work with us, the service providers, to see how their own scenarios will be changed and therefore how that will impact on us. And we started having, you know, very, again, very early conversations with donors, so including the IDB and, and yeah. other donor agencies to see what they were kind of looking at and what their, because again, you all have access to um, probably most, um, finer tuned tools to, to give forecasts on what these types of scenarios might be like. So we, we try to sort of touch base with everyone that we work with to paint a good picture um, of what the, the near future would look like. And yeah. I think because of that, we were able to, we started practicing more or less, you know, working with online tools, even while we were in the office. So when we actually made that transition to fully working from home, it was fairly seamless. Um, because we were almost um, piloting it uh, for at least for at least two weeks before. Okay, okay. So conversations with your internal, external stakeholders, everyone, um, everyone, yeah, even the practice. Um, what about the the training? Any sort of training and development initiatives? Because now, um, if you know you had done this, look at it two weeks uh, before you may have seen the need for technology onboarding and sensitization and so on. Any sort of um, a training? Well, we try to use, to go straight into some very low, um, low learning curve technology. So Microsoft tools, for example, um, it's a project management software, but it's not very convoluted. It's pretty simple. Um, and we stuck with, we had conversations about using things like Microsoft Teams for chat and video, but we decided as a group to stick with what we were comfortable mm -hmm. with, which was a WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups um, and Zoom. Even yeah. though Zoom has you know, issues in terms of um, privacy, you know, we, we weren't discussing anything um, confidential. So instead of, we, we want to limit the amount of novel tools that we try to use in a short space of time. So the okay. only new thing that we jumped into and started to learn as a group was Microsoft Planner, Microsoft Tasks. Um, and that was really, we, we tried to limit the, the steep learning curves. Okay, good. Karina, sticking on, on tools, um, you know, being that mature organization that you work in, and clearly Omar respects that. Um, what are some of the, the, the tools, the technological tools that you have been uh, using and how has been the impact? Thanks, Joseph. So yes, we've been using a number of the communications tools that Omar mentioned. Um, of course, we use Microsoft Suite and Teams a lot, Zoom. Um, we use Slack in the Caribbean department as a, as, as a chat um, platform. Um, we have WhatsApp groups, etc. And of course, I think to complement that, we also are using um, workflow management systems for our correspondence 
and online systems to process the payments that we make and so on to our executing agencies. So it, it's quite an elaborate IT setup that we have. One thing I can tell you is that the tools change and evolve over time. So probably the most important thing is to develop among the, the staff and the team this awareness and willingness to use technology. So no matter what the tool is, it, it may change. We may find that it, it's easier to, to use WebEx. It used to be WebEx back a few years ago. Yeah. Now we're using yeah. Teams. You, you just have to be receptive to, to using technology and, and um, accessing these tools in order to be able to communicate and manage your business. Yeah. One last thing I want to mention in, in, in addition to developing this, this technological awareness and receptivity among staff, um, in, in the IDB, there has been quite a lot of investment in management skills. So this is something we may overlook a lot, but in order to, to facilitate this smooth operation in the virtual environment, we have to invest in the managers and um, develop their ability to manage teams that operate virtually, um, give them certain skills in terms of situational um, leadership and, and management, um, even change management, different skills that allow managers to still bring the best out of their teams, regardless of whether we're working face-to-face -face or virtually. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, as you were speaking there, we had a question coming in um, from one of the, um, from one of our uh, participants. Um, let me just quickly state it here. Um, well, firstly, they clearly recognize the IDB as being mature and um, being ahead of the game, as they say, right? So I'm reading while I'm, I'm in front of you here. Uh, the question really is, is it possible for sharing to take place uh, so that we can minimize the, te the teaching problems? They're talking about your policies. Uh, they have recognized that your policies are robust, um, has been tested and tried, and it's working. So um, I guess this person would want some sort of um, onboarding at some point in time. You know, on the policy. Okay. Um, so Absolutely. Yeah. Joseph, yeah. Um, just to comment on that, I think I uh, agree. Um, certainly, we have begun by working really closely with our executing agencies. I know that Cropper is one of those. And so um, we tried first to bring them on board in, in, in collaborating directly with the bank using Teams. Yes. Um, in yes. addition to that, yes, we've shared our policies with the with with our counterparts in government as well in terms of teleworking policies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, um, capacity building takes place in an ongoing way to to make sure that we're all ready to work in this um, new agile environment. Yes. So I think yes. yes, there definitely is an opportunity in whichever country we work to have that kind of collaboration and, and knowledge exchange. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I'm seeing a number of questions coming in and colleagues, we cannot answer or respond to all, but I'm just selecting. Um, someone wants to know, keeping with you, Karina, the workflow management system that you're using, is there a specific uh, version or so that? Yeah, right now we're using EasyShare. <laughs> So mm -hmm. this is the latest one we use. And uh, of course, we, we scan correspondence on entry and assign it to various persons. And the responses are also tracked through the system. So um, it's a number of different tools that work together um, yes. in order to make sure that we, we track and, and maintain records. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you for that. Um, so again, I'm plucking out a couple of questions before we move on, because we said that there's going to be a conversation, interaction, and so on. Um, there's a question here, and I have to reframe, because I'm noticing the words elderly and old and so on. Um, but the question really is, recognizing that, okay, we're going to be into technology, and we're going to have staff members who are not tech savvy, um, not necessarily because of age, but simply they're not tech savvy. 
Um, Hanif or Umar, Marie, Ma, Muko, um, probably Hanif, how, how can you respond to this one? Um, I, I, I looked at the question as well, and like you, I, I wanted to reframe because you know we ran how we address people. But yeah. that is something that I, I have seen and I continue to work with, not only at the Children Authority, even in my lecturing opportunities, a lot of the people are saying like, listen, I don't know about this technology. What am I to do? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think, first of all, we need to normalize our response and let people know it is okay to not know, right? right. I think a lot of us, because we know, we make it seem as if it's a bad thing that you don't know. And the first thing I want people to do is normalize that, hey, it is okay to not know. And you know what? We will teach you. And as a company, you must be willing, just like you onboarded your staff at the beginning, you must now be willing to reboard your staff. I don't know if that's a terminology, mm -hmm. but you need to get your staff up there with the technology. And you must do it by being patient and understanding. So I always say you have to understand this new technological world from a humanistic perspective right we must understand the human we must understand how we operate and we must also understand the fear associated mm -hmm. with this newness mm -hmm. there is a fear that maybe the these people might move up fast in the organization now because they are tech savvy i might be left behind there is a real fear and mm -hmm. so in addition to all the technological enhancement we must also work that and amalgamated with people's human um, reaction to this. So normalize it, train them up, and work with them. That is, I mean, that's the best we can do. Yes, yes, yes. I saw a question Joseph, on, on, sorry, Joseph, go ahead. If I, if I can add, I think that absolutely agree with Hanif. I think that, you know, sometimes we find these tools intimidating. Mm -hmm. And the best thing to do is to just give it a try. Give yes, it a try. Yes. Don't be afraid to, to give yes. these tools a try. They really make our lives very, I mean, a lot easier. And yes. so yes. the idea is just you know, put aside those fears and, and give it a try. And right. uh, over time, we just become much more comfortable using yes. these tools. Correct. And, 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 and the fear is really not, sorry, Mokro, the fear is really not based on age and gender and so on. It's really, it's really a, a, a person's um, personal position. For example, I don't have Facebook, and I don't intend to be in Facebook and Instagram and those things. But now, if we have to put ourselves out there with that, I definitely will have fear, and I'm not elderly as you know, you know, you know <laughs> <per> <laughs> um, uh, Mirko, you wanted to say something? No, I want to just uh, add a few things. I will say Benjamin and uh, Karina. Uh, like technology, of course, help uh, us today and it would be if somebody fed the technology. Like I say, the first thing I learned to my kitchen, first to not use the knife to punch on the, <laughs> to use the finger instead of the knife to punch on mm -hmm. the, the, on the phone or the, or the things. But also you see them, what I can realize is the survival part of the human being. It just always, uh, you know, when you say, for example, you have not in Facebook, but if you have to, like my parents, they are old and I'm, they live in Italy, I'm living here. My mother, they never have a cell phone. Now they're mm -hmm. over the 80s. Now we do a, a video call. Yeah. My, other, my sister was home to show them, my, aunts, my nephews, to show them how to use it. And it takes a little while of patience, but they now they're calling me out of the blue. They do their, see, it's just like the survival skill or the one you really want something, you push your, the human being to push to see things you maybe you're not aware of. Especially those uh, situations like the codive is, uh, I think it was a push over a certain things because even we have a, uh, let's say this new generation, we now have a smartphone, uh, WhatsApp and everything. But the next 20, 30 years, we have the oldest people from today. Even we think with the technology, the next 20 years, we have no clue what's going on. And we have to rely on our nephews, on, do on sons and son to understand what's going on. Maybe we have yeah. a, a teletransport or something. We have no clue for them. It's not, yeah. actually we see always the new society. The kids are now at school, they use the tablets. Yeah. All my time, I'm not old, but I'm not healthy. Yes, but yes. on my school, I yeah. have a tablet, I have a calculator, that's it. Yes. The technology we had. So like you see, it's evolving. And uh, this situation like Codive or words, anything, I think is as push forward a few years to get into something 
you maybe you left out oh anony now anony now and the situation happened like codib and we had to kick in and we had to be on board of technology or yeah. it take a little time yeah. but you do because see all my all my stuff the survival uh inside your inside you when a situation happen happen you do it but when you are your surrounding is not comfortable you never be pushed to do no to go over your limits you just comfortable yeah. So for that is a uh, situation is bad, but like anything bad, bring something good. Yeah. Thank you for that. I want to I want to bring in Umar a bit. Um, there's another question I want to I want to take as it relates to motivation, uh, because clearly you know working in the virtual opposed to the physical co-located environment, uh, motivation, sense of morale, and those things are uh, different. So the question really is how you know how have you been able to uh, one. Uh, keep people motivated, but I also want to stem it into how have you been able to measure productivity as well? Um, yes, so I think we, like I said, we started really early to to practice what this might look like. So immediately moving into work from home, you know, we have, maybe not this week, this week was a little off, but we, we tend to have at least um, two to three collective Zoom meetings every week. Yeah. Um, mo most of the times, if nothing else, on Monday morning. Um, honestly, just so we know that it's Monday and the week is starting. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't know what day it is. Um, and that sort of sets the trend and the, the mood for the week. Um, but about productivity, I think we made it very clear early on that we're not measuring productivity by the number of hours you spend in front of the computer. And uh, we also made it very clear in talking as a team that we should not expect behavior that is um, similar to what the past reality might be. Because everyone's dealing with this in a different emotional and mental frame of mind. And, uh, you know, we... I, as a, as a head of an organization, and even in talking again to donors, you know, we had very frank discussions about deadlines being flexible. Um, and those, that flexibility not being an obligate, not being, um, having to be mandatory, because we, we don't know how people are dealing with the situation. I mean, you can ask them frankly, but, you know, everyone, everyone has their own situation to deal with. And we can't be expecting the same level of productivity eight to four when you have you know kids around other things happening mm -hmm. and it's it's unfair frankly yeah. and i think detrimental to uh morale if you if we hold fast to some of these things that to be frank even um formally probably didn't work as well and uh, so yeah so we I had those conversations um, very frankly, especially in the early um, one or two weeks about getting emails from people at 10, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, I said, no, let's, let's not do that. Um, let's not, um, let's try our best to have regular, regular hours mm -hmm. and not feel as if it's your obligation to work all around the clock. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And um, if Joseph. It, yeah. Yes. Okay, let Hanif Han come in. Joseph, I, I just wanted to add to what Omar is saying there because you see, what he's saying there is so pertinent because everyone's home situation is not mm -hmm. the same. And I think as leaders, we want deliverables, but we must understand KPIs. We must revise KPIs because you cannot have work from home KPIs as the same as eight to four office KPIs. That, that, that just cannot happen. Mm -hmm. And what we need to understand, and I think the conversation has to go a little deeper with your employees in terms of what you really face at home. Mm -hmm. Because home may be so chaotic for one person and office was their sanctity. For yeah. home, people may not have their mojo, if I could use that terminology, mm -hmm. because they work together with people in an office and that is what fuel their innovativeness. And now I am home alone and I just cannot produce. And so the, the stellar employee you had at number so and so office is not the same person you have working from home. And you cannot be punitive. You yeah. must become 
again, go back to that whole humanistic perspective and have that conversation. So mm -hmm. I am looking at KPIs from a project-based perspective as opposed to mm -hmm. a, um, a, a, a long one-year objective. And right. so every moment we look at it, because this thing is so fluid, yes. and you assess as you go along, and you change in tandem with the employee. Yes, we kind yes. of sit in our boardroom and say, do this, but we must understand how it works with the employee. Can it work? Mm -hmm. Are they able to make it work? And if so, what are the next steps? Yes, good. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, a comment in Karina's eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, I'll comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, Hanif makes a key point there. And as he would know, um, sometimes work from, from home, especially when it's mandatory as it is right now, exacerbates difficulties mm. in, the, in the home situation that may already exist. And so I think the key is to be as flexible as possible. <clears throat> um, sometimes as managers, it's comfortable to, to be able to manage people's time, to know that they are in front of you from eight to, to five or whatever, and that um, they're visible in, in a desk um, and a, apparently um, working hard on their computers, etc. But I think as, as we move forward, even if we return to, to the physical workspace, it's important to transition, to have this shift towards um, managing deliverables and outputs as as Hanif notes yeah. because yeah. Um, no matter where you're working you you work at a different pace um, based on the individual so mm -hmm. you know one person may complete a certain task in five hours and another may be able to complete the same task in three hours depending on their their aptitude or interest and so um, it's, it's important to agree those deliverables and uh, mm -hmm. uh, work towards those for the team instead of trying to monitor how much time people are spending on the activity. Another thing just to mention quickly, I think work from home can actually be quite productive. I mean, you, you definitely no longer have that commuting time. You know, sometimes if you're working from home, you just wake up and start to work and then it's it's evening and you have moved so this this again is something that we all need to manage in terms of having that balance yes yeah. because working in the same space means that we don't have that separation between our workspace and our home space unless we create it yeah and so this can can often lead to to, to a lack of balance um, which was even a challenge when we were going into the physical yes, work environment. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. And if come in, yes, sure. I, I also want to piggyback on what Corinna said there, because while you have those who are eager to work from home and who will get up and work, we also have those who home chilling. And, yes. <laughs> and, and so you have the difficulty with some members of staff must come out to work you have some who are at home working and you have some who are at home who may not be working. And yes. as an employer, you must now create this balance because you don't want to get into a whole disciplinary process because we have not even drafted out what a disciplinary process is going to look like from a work from home um, perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so you also really want to tie work from home to that KPI. For those of us who may be at home doing everything else but working, of course, coming from the understanding that you know what is going on at their home, but that is at the balance that supervises. And that is why we really insist that managers and supervisors are very, very um, down in there, more than usual in terms of deliverables, KPI, can it be done, can it not be done, what do you do, what are we changing? Because you don't want months to pass or weeks to pass only to realize that work from home was work from chill, you see? And so it's going to be important yeah. to manage yeah. that balance. Yeah. Or work from stress, because as someone is indicating, um, home may be 
somewhat abusive. It may, may not be conducive yes. to, to work in, and therefore it affects pro productivity and so on. But the comments that you're making uh, is now directing me to the, to the point that what would the new leader, new manager look like in the future? All right. Um, we all, we, I think we would want to believe that COVID-19 is not going to be here to stay. God's willing, we'll get a, a, a vaccine and what have you. But a lot of us are seeing that what is here to stay is the work from home um, paradigm. And, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, this creates a new leader, a new manager. And I mean, I have read so many management books and so on. Um, in recent times, we, we speak about agile project management. But correct me, how many books we really have or literature, you know, from in this context, you know, so clearly it's creating um, a new a new dimension to how we function, even how we do strategic planning, you talk about KPIs and, and so on. So it, it's going to reshape the whole organizational um, structure and architecture. Now, what we have been speaking to inadvertently, we have been looking at some of your lessons as well by responding to the questions. And we have to also manage time. We have about eight minutes again. Um, what I really want, and from each um, you know panelist, is a perspective as it relates to sustainability, continuity, and what is your viewpoint of you know the new normal. We have been hearing that you know bouncing around the new normal, but your positions that you have been throwing out this morning um, is telling me that the new normal is not what a lot of people think and where we're going to be fully virtual. So let me let me start with um, Mirko, um, then Omar, Hanif, and I'll conclude with Karina on what is your position on this new normal? Mirko? Definitely. Okay. For my environment, let's say restaurant, the new normal is go by day by day because uh, it's hard to manage will be the future, especially for uh, my, as much as I can use my technology, uh, the restaurateur, the restaurant food in place is uh, physical. And then the magic of the restaurant is to have interaction with the human being. Because even now we are here in the panelists, uh, I can see only the face, I can see what your hands doing, you yeah. know, a lot of things missing, which is the human uh, relationships, what we're going to miss it. And uh, so for that is, I can really, I, I didn't also, I don't want to think the future will be that only online as happening because I think uh, I want to be into this business just because I like to interact with people physically. Even the phone is easy, everything is easy, okay, is uh, now is a matter of, uh, of a situation, okay, I embrace it. But I wish and I hope really when a COVID situation happened, gone, to back to the whole new normal. Mm -hmm. Of course, with all precaution, but uh, to not lose that uh, human relationships, which I think uh, is a basics and is a fundamental for any society for now and the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mirka, thank you. Omar? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I hope like you that it's not going to be um, <laughs> cemented in the new normal forever. Um, I have faith in science that we will get somewhere soon, but I, I'm hoping that a couple of things do change. Um, this idea of hours being equivalent to productivity. Um, you know, I fully agree. We've always worked on deliverables um, at the foundation. So that's why it's maybe been a bit easier for us. Um, and I also hope that we, we are able to get a different perspective on just everything around this idea of productivity and working. So you maybe you don't need to have a suit and tie to be mm -hmm. productive. Yeah. You know, maybe you don't need, no offense, Anif, you, you look lovely, um, <laughs> um, that you don't need to sit in front of a computer for eight hours to be productive, and yeah. that the, and for people to really understand how important that human connection is. So maybe bosses who, who might not have appreciated that before could appreciate it now. Um, but definitely for civil society, I think so much of what we do is probably like the restaurants. It's so physical. Um, you know, we work with farmers, we work with community groups all over the country. Um, so that probably will not change because so much of that depends on personal interaction, you know, looking at the little, you know, micro politics between people when they communicate. And those are things that right now with technology, we can't replicate. Um, so definitely, I think there are things to be learned and taken on board, hopefully. 
Yes. Um, but there are so many other things that we 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 just need we need to go back towards with the necessary precautions. But yes. this is all. Yes. 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 Thank you, Omar. Omar, one of the reasons I'm I'm very um, you know hopeful is that we have a lot of parents praying and fasting for this COVID nineteen situation because children are driving them crazy. So I believe very soon something will happen. You know. <laughs> What is your position on this new normal business continuity at Children's Authority? I, I have often maintained, uh, um, Joseph, that we are literally um, producing what, what I call um, the new psychology of the mind. We, the, the way we operate, it, it's almost like cognitive behavior therapy we are doing on the world to change the way we are. By nature of who we are as Trinidadians, Trinbegonians, is, is touchy, feely, huggy, kissy kind of people. We enjoy that, you know, reach to work at quarter to seven, quarter Italian to eight, and walk by the cooler until 8.30 kind of people, because that is who we are. But the normal, I do not, somehow, even if vaccines and all of this, I don't mm -hmm. see us going back to what we knew it to be. I am convinced that soon enough we're going to hear unions and all these people come and say, look, you all worked well at home. Nobody had to beat a clock. Nobody had to beat traffic. I come from south to east every day. Six hours of traffic normally. Now I reach up the road in record time. And so I think as a responsible agency, we must begin to put things in place from a technological perspective as well as a humanistic perspective because a big part of what we do requires human connectivity. We cannot technologize that part of the world. We, we cannot do that. And so we have to be able to examine from a technological perspective what realistically we can do and what are those things that we must do from a humanistic perspective. And I think once you get the amalgamation of the two, you are able to see the new normal and you're able to work it well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hanif. Thank you. So, Karina, we started the conversation with you, um, representing IDB, and it's uh, and you're the only lady here, and it's perfect to finish with you as well. Um, so, what is your position on this look ahead for for IDB, and also your personal perspective? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with my fellow panelists that um, the new normal is going to look different, perhaps to what we were used to in the past, which is good. Change is, is something we should welcome, I think. Um, and even if it isn't um, COVID-19, it may be something else. It may be storms. It may be um, a new communicable disease. It could be something else. Um, I think the critical element is that both um, environments are useful. It's very important to have human interaction as human beings and to, to be able to work um, face to face, be able to see each other and, and, and have that interaction. And equally important to have the virtual environment and be able to operate well in that space also um, because it has its advantages. What I think we need is the flexibility to be able to move seamlessly between the two environments whenever it's needed. And as long as we can do that, we're going to be ready for whatever the future holds. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I like, I like that point you make, being able to seamlessly move between the virtual and physical office environment. Um, and of course, that, that speaks to both the technological and human side, side of things. Uh, colleagues, as we know, um, this webinar was really for a, a tight one hour, a focused one hour. Um, and we have come to the end um, you know, of this session, but a couple of things. Um, COVID-19 has certainly caused significant disruption uh, in the way we live and work and interact and socialize and so on. And many of us who are on this, or if not all of us who are on this webinar, you know, we can choose to see this disruption um, as either a threat or as the panelists would have, um, you know, indicated, I think you all have seen it more um, as an opportunity. 
um, to invent, reinvent, um, to reposition, to restructure, to re-strategize, and so on. Um, very importantly, it requires systemic policy adjustments, retooling, retraining, reorientation, um, or, or as Hanif would have said, deorientation, I believe, um, and also keeping that bird's eye view on the human side of things. And, and, and therefore, you know, in moving forward, um, this webinar, we know we have so many webinars taking place and sometimes it could be now webinar overload, but really and truly, you know, the IDB colleagues would have seen it fitting that, you know, at least we share one hour of our time um, presenting to a cross section of our, you know, colleagues and, and partners and so on to share this perspective. This was a conversation, as we say, a dialogue, as we say. We would have learned some lessons. We would have hear perspective and so on. And, and therefore, panelists, firstly, I want to say thank you for, you know, really spending this, this hour with us. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insights. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you to the, the, the background team, the technical team, um, who would have, you know, put this session in place and who ensure that we had good song and good video and, and so on. Um, and also thank you to the listening audience. I think we had about 105, I was looking on, we had 105 participants. Thank you for taking this hour of your busy schedule. A lot of us probably would have taken time from homeschooling. And I'm not too sure if we could really homeschool, but we took time from that and other meetings and so on. And the questions that you have posed, um, I got a note here that please feel free if you wish to send your questions to the IDB, IDB Trinidad at IDB.org, um, and you will be able to get a response um, and so on. All right, so with that, we try to keep it to our, our commitment. And again, thank you. Please, I can't say safe travel because most likely you're just going in the kitchen and so on, but um, <laughs> but be safe and thank you and God bless everyone.